Welcome to Things That Are Harder Than You Think, where we examine different features in video games and talk about why they're actually more difficult than you might imagine. Today, we're going to talk about hair. And I think I can keep this quick because the primary reason that hair is harder than you think is because of a combinatorial explosion. So we've made it. Good job. Thank you, everybody. As always, like and subscribe, and I'll see you again next time. Now, what's that? You need a bit more detail than that? Okay, let's back up. Okay, first we need to talk about how hair works in video games. Let's bring my head back up here. So, the first thing you notice is it's not a skin. It doesn't bend and flex like a skin. It's not a rigid object. It does move around. Interacts with the light differently. It's sort of translucent and incredibly fine. Really, the way to think about hair is it's like a thousands of tiny little springs on your head. But you can't really model thousands of little springs. That's just not practical in a game that has to run in real time. So there's a lot of techniques used. Um, sometimes you take a bunch of individual hairs and you will render them onto cards and then pile the cards up on your head. Uh, sometimes you will, for larger things, model them like a ponytail you might model as an individual object and then have it interact with physics. From a rendering perspective, it is something that's different and separate from other objects that you're going to have in the game. But the reality is, is that the rendering itself, that's something that as technology is getting better, uh, games are getting better and better at doing. Uh, new techniques are coming along that are allowing better looking hair. The real problem is how it interacts with things. So what do I mean by things? I literally mean everything. Every object in the world, every part of the body. Take a look at this guy. So as he's moving, his hair is pushing against his shoulders as he's moving, and uh, it would look wrong if it was passing right through the shoulder, which is what you often see. With this woman here, it is interacting with her face and her nose, and each of these things introduces a place where bugs can be you have to make decisions about how complex you're going to want your hair to be. Let's see if I can make this combinatorial explosion clear. So if you're adding a hair, you're going to have to take a look and see how it interacts with all your hats and helmets. And then you're going to have to look at how those interact with all your different animations that could affect the way the hair works. And then all the weapons and then your noses and brows and ears and other parts of the face that can interact with the hair. If the hair is long enough, you've got to worry about pauldrons, things on the back like flags. If you're sitting down, now you have to worry about props and chairs and things like that. And if you want to interact with other characters, you've got to do all of that for every character that you could possibly interact with. So let's put some numbers against this. If we're going to add a single hair, one hair, Say you have 10 different hats, or 10 different styles of hats even, that you have to check against. And you feel like constraining this already, you're not going to check all of your animations. You think there are just about five animations which are going to be relevant to the way the hair works. Now ideally you check them all, but you're just going to check those five. There are three different weapons that are long enough to interact in, with the area of the hair, so that's what you're going to check with. You've got only three different nose styles. Uh, you've constrained your noses into three different styles, and that's what you're going to check against. Again, not checking against all your noses, just checking against the broad categories. With brows, there are only two broad strokes, so that's all you're going to check against. Same with ears. You've got some big pointy ears, and you've got some long horn-like ears, so you're going to check against those. You've mostly stayed away from pauldrons, but you've got three suits of armor that have got some big ones, so you better check against those for all of your long hairstyles. And you've got two different flags, so you have to check against that. You've got a relatively small number of uh, cases where there are props you can interact with, just three different styles of chair. Now, if your chairs are different sizes or built of different materials, really you should check against all the chairs, but you're just going to check against the three broad types. 
And you know what? We're just not going to worry about interacting with other characters. We're just not going to do that. So what does that lead to? Well, that's 32,400 different permutations caused by one additional hairstyle. So hopefully that drives home what I mean when I say combinatorial explosion. One additional hair can add an immense amount of new possibilities and new things that need to be tested. Now I've constrained this somewhat artificially and I've left a bunch of things off the list that would need to be tested against. Some of you may be wondering if that multiplication is appropriate in all cases. And it isn't strictly, but you can be surprised how interactions with one object can cause faulty interactions with others. If you have the hair being pushed out of position by a pauldron, then now suddenly the arms of a chair, which weren't a problem before, could suddenly become a problem. So those combinations are relevant more often than you would think. But yes, there is an opportunity to simplify and remove some of that mathematical complexity. So what can you do about this? There are really two approaches, and some combination of both is really probably the way forward. The first thing you can do is put constraints in place. So if you make it such that hair disappears when helmets are on, you remove the helmets from that combinatorial math. If you make it so that hair doesn't go longer than the waist, then you don't have to worry about accessories on the knees and hips and such. But of course, those constraints come at a cost. You're limiting what you're allowing your artist to do in order to simplify the job. So it's a balancing act. The second thing is to just care less. In combat, for example, you probably don't need to worry about what the hair is doing around the face or around the arms because it's moving quickly and small penetrations or intersections probably don't matter that much. So you can remove those animations from your list of checking. But there's a limit to how far you can go with this. If you have close-ups in cutscenes, you still need to care about the brow ridge and the nose and the ears. If you have long ponytails, then you need to care about what it does with the back. By combining these two restrictions, you can shrink and reduce down the things that you need to be concerned about. One of the advantages that people who make hair mods often have is they're able to take advantage of both of these simplifications. They will make hair that only works with a single race or a single outfit, and that allows them to really restrict the combinatorial math that they're dealing with. And secondly, often they don't actually care that much if the hair goes through an arm in one pose because they're really looking for that extravagant hair in a specific commonly used animation or pose. And I think there's something to be learned there for game developers that maybe we worry too much about what the hair is doing in all circumstances and less about the opportunity to make interesting or compelling hairs that work most of the time. So why don't we see more black hairstyles? For me, there are two primary reasons. One that's good and one that's not so good. The better reason is that black hair does behave differently. So you can't just use your existing hair work in order to make a black hairstyle. It requires additional work. The second and really bad reason is a lack of diverse voices in your team. If you have a team that doesn't include people who are aware of these different styles or care about them, then it's easy for these things to be missed and not considered when you're building hairstyles. By the way, this is also the reason why makeup options in video games are often so bad as well. A lack of diverse voices at the table. Now to be clear, these are reasons, they aren't excuses. And we're starting to see this being addressed by more and more game companies, but it is your responsibility as a game maker to ensure that you provide as wide of a variety of hairstyles as is possible given your constraints and budget and such. So that's a quick overview of hair, but really about what makes hair more complicated than you might have thought. We will do more in this series as we delve into other aspects of game development that are surprisingly complicated. I hope you found this useful. If you did, give it a like, 
Share it with someone that you think would also get some use out of it. Thank you, and I'll see you again soon.